Hello everyone. So in our continuing series of discussion on sustainability tools and approaches from different domains, in today's lecture we will be discussing about the domain agriculture. So what we will be discussing is about uh, some basics related to agriculture, the um, scenario in the Indian context, the unsustainability is uh, related to this particular context. Then we will go through couple of methods which are uh, called as sustainability assessment of food and agriculture system, SAFA, response inducing sustainability evaluation rise, committee on sustainability assessment COSA and criteria for sustainable farming. These are some of the um, guidelines or measurement tools which can be used in this particular domain for measurement of sustainability or for design of um, with a sustainability focus. So, let us start with trying to understand in a brief manner about agriculture especially in the context of India. So, agriculture is an important sector of the Indian economy and it employs about half of the population and accounts for 13.7 percent of the nation's GDP and around 11 percent of its exports. The current average annual growth rate of the sector is around 2.8 percent. Accelerating the growth rate of this sector is necessary to meet the overall GDP target of the country and meeting the food requirements of the country. Also as you can see it is something which employs about half of our population so you can understand the importance of this particular sector. But while looking for avenues of boosting growth it is also important to keep in mind the environmental and socio-economic impact of the growth boosting activities. So, soon in couple of uh, slides we will start discussing how the current uh, growth boosting activities have had a adverse impact on the environmental as well as the socio-economic aspects. On the global front food security and sustainable agriculture has been set as top priorities for development by the United Nations. Now India supports world 17 percent of human and 15 percent of livestock population on its 2.4 percent of world's geographical area. Factors like increase in demand for industrialization, urbanization, housing and infrastructure is leading to the conversion of agricultural land into non-agricultural use. Where does all the new land come from? It comes nowhere from. It is agricultural land which is converted into non-agricultural use, which means this land which is available to us for doing agriculture is shrinking day by day. Thus, the scope for expansion of agricultural land in the country is limited and the reverse effect is true that the land is actually decreasing. So, we have to increase the productivity of the land so that we can meet our ever increasing demand for food. As per agricultural census of government of India 2010-11, marginal and small farm holdings together account for 85 percent of the total operational holdings and 44 percent of the total operated area. Operated area means like uh, not all land which is under agricultural use will be um, uh, cultivated each and every year. So, operated area or the operational holdings they de um, demarcate all those land holdings which are actually under cultivation. So, um, uh, if 85 percent of our all uh, farm holders are marginal and small farmers which means most of our farms are less than 2 hectares in size. Thus, most of our farms are smaller than 2 hectares. Also, the average size of the land holding for all operational classes have declined from 2.82 hectares in 1970-71 to 1.16 hectare in 2010 and 2011. So, you can see the drastic decrease and as a result the requirement to increase the productivity. Another uh, phenomenon is around 50 percent of the Indian population depends on agriculture as its main source of income. Why I am introducing this topic in this particular manner? Because a large number of us are just not aware about you know, of this entire domain altogether. Many of you must be from rural areas and from um, agriculture backgrounds and you might know about all these aspects. But mostly people who are living in cities, they hardly ever think about the agricultural domain, hence this kind of an introduction. So, considering the population dynamics of India, Central Institute of Agricultural Engineering Bhopal uh, predicts in its 2050 vision document 
that by 2020 which is just 2 years away 45 percent of the 230 million agriculture workers will be women. So, half of our population depends on agriculture for its livelihood and of that 45 percent which means almost half of the um, uh, agricultural workers will be soon women and unfortunately our agricultural machinery development and all those sectors are still not um, uh, geared up to look into this new demographics which is emerging in this particular field. So, none of the machinery is designed keeping in mind the ergonomical requirements of the female population or the requirement that one needs to train the women to operate them. So, now coming to the after this brief introduction I will tell you about some of the problems. So, two of the main sustainability related issues which usually gets discussed in the domain of agriculture is about food security. So, which means you have to have agriculture, the agriculture has to be sustainable so that you can ensure food security for the population. And the other aspect is how can I bring resilience in the agricultural system so that it can mm, combat the climate change. So, say for example, farmers through long mm, mm, historical era, so farmers usually learn how to do farming from their forefathers and they had learned it from their forefathers. So, the existing agricultural practices, the cycles, the knowledge has evolved over a long period of time. Now, the climate change that we are experiencing is very drastic with respect to the time frame in which all that knowledge has developed. So, how in spite of these climate change, how can we quickly adopt our agricultural practices so that we can still maintain our the sustainability of our mm, food sources. So, these are topics related to sustainability in of agriculture mm, because we need food security and because climate change is impacting agriculture in a big way. Now, let us look at the other set of problems, problems caused due to agriculture advances in in terms of sustainability. So, let us start with discussion on environmental aspects. So, India so all of us know about the green revolution which started mostly in the northwestern part of the country. So, Punjab, Haryana, western Uttar Pradesh and um, adjoining regions they were the ones who adopted green revolution first as a result the use of fertilizer, pesticides, irrigation facilities, machinery they saw a boost and all that resulted in a bumper crop production for the country and bringing in food security for us. But slowly we can see the economic cost of environmental damage. So, if you remember in our life cycle assessment, we were trying to figure out what is the economic cost of environmental damage. Now, the green revolution had taken place couple of decades back. And now, we can slowly see the economic cost of environmental damage that we have done due to the inappropriate use of fertilizers, pesticides and irrigation. Although there is no systemic pan India study accounting for this cost is in place, but some studies have been done in certain pockets. So, for example, a study of three villages in Midnapur district of West Bengal reveals that the villages will require about 50 percent increase in their current income in order to compensate for the loss of natural resources and environmental deterioration. So, you can see this study has been done way back in 1996, this might have increased quite a bit by today. Why so? Because of the environmental damages caused to the uh, soil, uh, uh, fertilizers and pesticides have uh, poisoned the soils to a certain extent and you need more and more of them you have over harvested the fields without leaving the fields fallow and so on. So, as a result to uh, the natural resource of soil has uh, suffered degradation. So, in order to still keep on producing uh, the crops one has to uh, put in lot more fertilizers and other such inputs. So, there is a cost related to these inputs. So, in order to incur those costs, the farmers will have to have 50 percent increase in their current income, so that they can spend that much amount of money. 
also say for example due to over irrigation due to taking out of too much of water from the soil in many parts of the country the water table has gone uh, way below uh, the mark so the amount of energy so now you have to have deeper and deeper bore wells to get water so the amount of energy spent to draw the water for irrigation is has also uh, the money has tremendously increased so a study on rice and wheat production in punjab this is a study from 2006 shows this is also a decade back study so shows that on account of decline in water table depleting macro and micronutrients and increased use of pesticides the cost of producing wheat and rice went up by rupees 63 per ton and rupees 189 per ton respectively so here you can see the point that we were trying to discuss india is suffering from economic cost of environmental damage due to inappropriate use of fertilizer pesticides and irrigation as a result of which the macronutrients micronutrients water table has depleted crop diversity has reduced leading to increased use of pesticides and all this has has an impact on the amount of input cost for producing crops damage is done to the land so land degradation is a, is not only an indian phenomenon but it's an in universal phenomenon now and is associated with higher level of irrigation fertilizer and insecticide use it is also attributed to heavy soil disturbance caused by tillage machinery so we have used huge machinery like uh, tractor operated rotovators and all uh, kind of machinery to work on the soil before we can put uh, our uh, crops into it this has created heavy soil disturbances and decline in physical chemical and biological properties of soil thereby limiting crop yield also intensive cropping intensive cropping means uh, you keep on uh, planting one crop after another without leaving the field uh, with some time to recuperate so intensive cropping leads to nutrient deficiency in the soil and fertilizer usage leads to nitrate and phosphate leaching and subsequent contamination of the groundwater so when the same groundwater is consumed by human beings or the um, livestock it again somehow in, will end up into our own bodies itself causing health damages as the soil quality degrades agriculture becomes more dependent on fertilizers and pesticides leading to increased input cost and decline in profit margins so this is kind of a vicious circle so sikkim has is the first state in india which is declared now completely based on organic farming so there is no farm in sikkim now which uses chemical and chemical fertilizers and insecticides so a couple of years back the government of sikkim decided to go completely organic they removed all subsidies from uh, chemical fertilizers and pesticides and uh, encouraged using um, say vermicompost which is a kind of a natural um, fertilizer and so on they also trained farmers on how to use Uh, these uh, natural bio fertilizers how to use bio pesticides and so on and now the whole state is uh, grows its food organically 65% of the organic food which is uh, in india comes from the state of sikkim and you can imagine such a small state now coming to water so water bodies and ground water is polluted as a result of excessive use of fertilizers and pesticides also due to excessive use of ground water partly caused by subsidized pumps and diesels so you can see we created a vicious problem because we wanted to increase the uh, productivity of the land which was possible when we bring in irrigation facilities irrigation can be done by using machines like pump uh, pumping units and the pumping units need to run on diesel so the government gave subsidies on pumps and diesels as a result many people could afford them now and but the the consequence of that has been a decrease in water table so now you have to spend more and more money on mm, pumps and mm, diesel so in your input cost has gone up and at some places the water level has depleted so badly that even doing agriculture is no longer a viable solution so as a result there is a sharp decline in availability of water for human consumption as well 
Also the cost for mining water for agriculture has gone up. A serious risk of soil salinity increase has emerged in many parts of the country along with increase in arsenic poisoning of water because of too much of uh, watering and also because the uh, water tables have gone down and led to arsenic uh, poisoning soil salinity has increased and in such conditions of course crops cannot grow because co cro each crop needs an optimal soil salinity now coming to the flora and fauna so due to propagation of high yielding varieties of crops and growing of specific high return crops only the local varieties of crops as well as wild plants are disappearing fast. So when there used to be lots of different kinds of local varieties of crops along with wild plants, pest attack or disease attack was much lower because of the variety being present. Also because the varieties had evolved over time so they know how to counteract each other, the impact of pests and so on. But with the, high, with the adoption of high yielding varieties, so hectares after hectares there will be only one type of variety or maybe two types of variety which led to a increased vulnerability to pest attack and hence requirement for more the use of more pesticides. So this on the one hand is causing loss of biodiversity and on the other hand making crops more vulnerable to pest attack. As a result, the need and consumption of pesticides have gone up. When the need and consumption of pesticide will go up, also the input cost of doing agriculture will go up, leading to problems for the farmers. Also due to loss of forest and plant diversity, loss of fauna like honeybees, sparrows, crows is rampant and all of us know they are very, very important for our agriculture to survive. These fauna play an important role in agriculture. Now let us discuss about the economic unsustainabilities which have been brought in. So economic unsustainabilities because of the uh, non-optimal resource utilization. Say for example, so I am not presenting an exhaustive list of them, I am just presenting few of them which gives you an idea that if you are interested to work in this domain, where will you look for? resource utilization related um, uh, optimization and unsustainabilities. Say for example, although tractors are very versatile in nature, they are underutilized as they are often bought without proper guidance related to farm size, crop area, cropping pattern and intensity, cultivation technology, captive uh, versus custom use mode, etc. and its influence on the return on investment in tractor. So, tractor can be a 120 HP tractor, can be a 150 HP tractor, can be a 200 HP tractor. Now while you go to buy a tractor, the farmer should know that what kind of utilization the farmer is going to do with this particular tractor, what all kind of field operations and what size uh, his or her field is. Then when I say captive versus custom use mode. So, there might be also some uses like uh, I um, put a trailer behind my um, uh, tractor and use it for carrying goods or maybe I um, use my tractor for some kind of um, uh, river dredging kind of activities. So, uh, I need to know what are the different activities which I will be doing with my tractor, what on field and what off field activities when it comes to on field activities. Uh, what is my farm size, what is the kind of crops that I want to grow, whether I want to offer this tractor for services to other farmers also or not. Once I do all these calculations, I should be able to find out what uh, type of tractor should I buy. But mostly such kind of actions is not being done. As a result, people tend to buy higher energy, higher um, horsepower um, tractors than what is required. And then what it happens is they do not get enough return on their investment. So that is why I am talking about economic unsustainability. Also it has been observed that farmers tend to use higher HP tractors than recommended for the soil conditions leading to under utilization of the uh, tractors. Similar under utilization has been observed for electric motors as well as diesel pumps and across all um, most of the machinery. The under utilization is observed to be much higher on smaller farms 
as compared to medium and large farms. That is another area of trouble because uh, the tractors are not very well suited for the kind of small farms that we have. And people still use those uh, implements because there are not many suitable implements available. So, the underutilization observed over there is way much more drastic than in the medium and large farms. Now, let us discuss about the socio-cultural unsustainabilities. The green revolution has brought in food security to the country and helped in increasing agricultural income, which is a very, very good aspect. But it has also brought in various ill effects along with it. So, we will discuss about those ill effects as the unsustainabilities and see how can we, mm, uh, of course, we have to bring in food security and we have to incre increase agricultural income, but how can we bring them in a more sustainable manner. So, a study of socio-cultural impact of green revolution in the state of Punjab reveals that the socio-economic fabric of agricultural society has changed remarkably in terms of social relations, cultural health and economic values. So, how does has that happened? So, some examples of it. The change to commercialized agriculture has had an adverse effect on other rural non-farming communities like carpenter, lock and smith, whose livelihood used to depend on making agri tools. But now, agricultural machinery is being produced by larger companies, larger manufacturing units. So, they have lost their livelihood. Some researchers also argue that others, other social issues linked to current agricultural practices in Punjab are uh, like huge farmer debts leading to increase in suicide, female feticide, breakdown of social network, unemployment and meager career options leading to drug and alcohol addiction amongst youth. So, many researchers have blamed that these adverse impacts on the socio-cultural fabric has also been because of the Ag uh, shift towards commercialized agriculture. Some other studies in the Himalayan belt on the impact of shifting to cash crops. So, cash crops are crops which um, can um, be sold in the market and you can get money very easily. So, say for example, coffee is a cash crop, tea is a cash crop. So, shifting to cash crops from traditional subsistence agriculture. Subsistence agriculture is when you grow crops for your own family's consumption shows that although the farmer's income has grown, but their vulnerability due to climatic and market conditions have increased, leading to exploitation by middlemen of marginal farmers. So, be very careful in this particular segment, we are not arguing against the usage of modern machinery or chemicals or going towards commercialized farming. That is not the point of argument. The point of argument is we need to think in terms of long term sustainability and what will be the impact of each and every decision that we uh, take and we have to ensure that we design the whole, whole ecosystem in a manner that long term sustainability can be achieved. Due to migration of the population towards urban areas because it is no longer so profitable to do agriculture or because the non-agricultural um, laborers like the um, locksmith, the carpenter and so on, they have lost their um, jobs. So, um, there is a migration of population towards urban areas. That is leading to large shortage of field laborers and at the same time it is putting a lot of pressure on the urban areas. Its impact on agriculture can be seen in terms of reduction in crop yield, reduction in cropping intensity and changes traditional cropping pattern. Why? Because if field laborers are not available, say for example, mm, uh, still sowing of seeds, harvesting of mm, uh, the field is not mechanized to a great extent. Mostly the mechanization, complete mechanization has happened in for, mm, uh, wheat, but for most other crops this has not happened. Hence, it is still uh, agriculture is still a labor intensive mm, activity during the sowing time, during the harvesting time. Now, because these uh, populations, they have migrated to, uh, they are migrating towards the cities, again agriculture is no longer viable because the existing laborer is meager and expensive and not available on time. So, everybody needs to harvest their field almost at the same time. Now, mm, uh, there are not enough laborers to do the same. 
so it has impacted the whole economy also by increasing the wage rates thereby high cost of cultivation for the farmers the rising cost of hiring labor as well as unpredictability of their availability is leading many farmers to abandon farming activities altogether so here you can see because so all these parameters that do tell us that we maybe we if we want to solve this problem there might be an option that we might do we can go ahead for appropriate mechanization mechanization of activities like sowing and harvesting can significantly reduce labor intensity weeding is another activity which consumes high labor involvement and requires appropriate mechanization in fact because one has to do weeding so many times so say for example some long duration crops like turmeric and ginger they are long duration crops they are harvested somewhere between 9th to the 11th month after they have been sown so because of this long duration lots of time weeding has to be done so weeds are all unwanted plants growing in the field and the cost of labor cost of weeding is the highest expense for growing ginger and turmeric so now let's look at how do we do sustainability assessment in these part in the domain of agriculture so we will discuss these uh, four tools safa rice kosa and ksnl so the guidelines for sustainability assessment of food and agriculture systems this is a very comprehensive uh, guideline it was formulated by the food and agriculture organization of the united nations it was meant for assessment of sustainability along food and agriculture value chains it is meant for enterprises whether companies or small scale producers so you can see it, uh, one of the criteria for using this tool is that it should be an enterprise which can be either a company or a small scale producer involved with the production processing distribution and marketing of goods have a clear understanding of the constant components of sustainability and how strength weaknesses and progresses could be stacked the guidelines are produced in the same spirit of codes of practice guidelines and other recommended measures to assist in achieving sustainable and fair practices in food and agricultural production and trade so these are again in line with the kind of guidelines that we have been discussing in this particular course so this is an example of the boundary of safa assessment so you can see it clearly say, states that it does not assess products or processes but it assesses enterprises so there are two examples over here the first one is a dairy farmer safa and a dairy retail safa a farmer is a producer a retail is a company so it can be used for both so two examples of safa scope in dairy supply chains the shaded rectangles with bold writing symbolize actors whose operations are covered by a safa performed by a dairy producer and a retail company the dashed rectangles represent actors outside the general scope of safa so here you can see in this particular context the scope of safa is dairy farmer and dairy which is all the processes and the transport included into it in this particular context that is the scope of safa now agricultural machinery dealer cattle breeder feed provider agro provider all these the waste disposal company all these are also part of this for this dairy farmer to work they have to be part of the system but safa does not do a assessment of these so the scope of safa is only over here because we do not assess products or processes what we assess is an enterprise so we will assess the enterprise of the dairy farmer which consists of the dairy farmer in his setup inclusive of the transport uh, inclusive of the transport because the dairy farmer own his or her own transport and then again it goes into a different cycle say for example if i see the dairy retail again there are machinery dealers cattle breeders feed providers butchery by product processors and so on but they are outside the scope of safa they are either products or the processes what is inside the scope of the retailer is 
the dairy farmer, the dairy inclusive of transport, food processor, carrier, wholesaler, carrier and retailer. So, you can see this was so here I could have done an individual SAFA for each of them, but if I want to study the whole system, I can also do a SAFA for this whole thing. So, it has to be a producer or an enterprise. So, it does not assess products or processes, but assesses enterprises. So, the target audience of a SAFA assessment is small, medium and large scale companies, organizations and other stakeholders that participate in crop, livestock, forestry, aquaculture and fishery value chains. However, as a framework and harmonized global assessment approach, SAFA is also relevant to government strategies, policy and planning. It is focused on supply chains and the evaluation of enterprises in those supply chains. Other sustainability assessment programs have a product focus and often use a life cycle assessment approach which has an emphasis on the evaluation of the environmental impacts of a product through its life cycle. So, it is not that life cycle analysis is not important, it is very very important for doing an assessment of the products and the processes, but in the scope of SAFA they are not included, they are part of other approaches that uh, can um, be taken. SAFA is focused on the um, evaluation of the enterprise. SAFA covers many of the same elements of a product based LCA such as analysis of the inputs, outputs and environmental impacts, however the focus on an enterprise rather than a product. So, the SAFA is not a rating of product specific sustainability nor does it cover the use and end of life phases of products that is at what happens at the consumer level. So, there are certain indicators and parameters of the SAFA method for evaluating the sustainability of agricultural production. If you want to read more about this particular mm, method, then you can go through this particular mm, reading material. So, to summarize, this is how the mm, parameters look like. So, these are called as indicators and parameters. So, I have governance, social, economy and environment. So, let us see the dimensions. So, our first dimension is good governance because I am talking at an enterprise level that is why I am concerned about governance. So, what are the themes inside this dimension? Corporate ethics, accountability, participation, rule of law, holistic management. There are also sub themes. So, say for example, in corporate ethics we have mission statement, due diligence, in accountability, holistic audits, responsibility, transparency. When you go through mm, this particular document, you will get to know in detail about more of each of these mm, sub themes and themes and dimensions. The next dimension is about environmental integrity. So, the main themes in this are atmosphere, water, land, biodiversity, materials and energy and animal welfare. These guidelines although they are meant for an enterprise level, you can directly see how the impact is. So, like when we were discussing about unsustainability at the agricultural field, at the end of it the impact is on the farmer or on the enterprise. So, you can relate the importance why we need to discuss. So, whatever we do to the atmosphere is going to ultimately after a point of time have an impact on the enterprise of farming. So, atmosphere consisting of greenhouse gases, air quality, then water, land, biodiversity, materials and energy, animal welfare. The next dimension is the third dimension is economic resilience. The themes in it are about investment. So, how internal investment, community investment, long ranging uh, profitability. So, you can see if uh, so all the unsustainabilities that we were discussing in our previous slides, you can put them in one of these sub themes. So, if one would have taken one of these sub themes to begin with and thought onto it, we mm, could have come up with alternative solutions which would have brought in sustainability in this dimension. Then coming to vulnerability, so stability of production, stability of supply, stability of market liquidity, risk management, product quality and information, so food safety, food quality, product information, impact on the local economy. 
so value creation local procurement then comes the fourth dimension which is social well being so how can i generate decent livelihood which can be sub themed as quality of life capacity development fair access to means of production fair trading practices responsible buyers rights of suppliers then coming to labor rights employment relations forced labor child labor freedom of associating and right to bargaining equity non discrimination gender equality support to vulnerable people human safety and health workplace safety and health provisions public health cultural diversity indigenous knowledge food sovereignty so now how do we do this particular how do we operationalize this particular the method the safa so the methodological sheet for safa indicator seeks to assist users assessing their level of fulfillment of the safa sub theme objectives in each case the proposed default indicator answers a specific question the safa entails responding to the following 118 questions so i have presented only couple of these questions over here as an example the reading material that i have uh, shared that has uh, all these uh, questions the, all the 118 questions so um, uh, a particular farmer a particular enterprise can assess them either by saying yes no and there is a need to be quantified so mission explicitness is the mission of the enterprise articulated in all enterprise reporting and understood by all employees or members so say if i say yes it is understood then i have to say to what extent is the enterprise mission evident in codes and policies and can the governance body demonstrate the impact of its mission on developing policy and practice say i say no then i might have to do certain activities so that i can Mm, come to yes at least to certain extent there are more assessment and impact tools so rice and cosa are two tools rice stands for response inducing sustainability evaluation and cosa stands for committee on sustainability assessment so these are two tools which were developed by researchers and can aid in the performance assessment stage of safa so response inducing sustainability evaluation rice rice is a method for holistic assessment of sustainability of agricultural production at farm level so this one only talks about agricultural production at farm level it is a questionnaire based farmer interview method for assessment of sustainability the indicators and parameters of the rice method for evaluating the sustainability of agricultural production that's what we will discuss you can read more about this particular technique by going through this particular source so the uh, this particular assessment method it consists of indicators state parameters and driving force parameters so say my indi first indicator is energy the state parameters for that is environmental effects of energy carriers used so say for example i am using diesel energy so i have to uh, say what are the environmental effects of the energy carrier use the uh, in that context it is the uh, diesel energy say if i am using electricity then for the same say i am using biomass so i am burning biomass so what is the environmental effect effects of the energy carriers used the driving force parameters here will be energy input per unit of agricultural land and energy input per unit workforce then my next indicator is water the state parameters are water quantity and stability of the quantity of uh, water so again the driving forces are water quantity and productivity on the basis of crop and animal production risks of water quality on manure silage leach uh, leachage waste water and so on my next indicator is soil so here again you can see all those parameters on which we were talking about unsustainability is brought into the agriculture because of um, intensive um, agriculture you can see all those indicators are present over here so we can again take into these uh, consideration these indicators these indicators have also been specifically designed for production at the farm level so they are very very suitable indicators to be used for doing any kind of 
design intervention in this particular context. So, I have soil which takes into consideration soil pH, saline, uh, salinization, water logging, soil sampling, erosion index. Then I have biodiversity, so biodiversity promoting practices. I have NNP which is nitrogen and phosphorus emission potential, so NNP balance, manure storage and application. Nitrogen and phosphate uh, emission potential arises because of the use of fertilizers. Then plant protection, so quality of the application, eco and human toxicology risks because of the plant protection method that we are using. Say for example, pesticides, they might have some toxicological impact on the ecology as well as the human beings. Then I have waste, so environmental hazard, methods of waste disposal, economic stability, net debt service over change in owners equity and interest paid, equity ratio, gross investment. Economic efficiency, so return on assets, return on equity, total earned income. Local economy, share of regional workforce and salaries, lowest salary on farm compared to average regional salary. So, you can see we are talking about all stakeholders, it is not only that we are talking about the farmer, but we are also concerned about the laborers who will be working on that farm. We are also concerned about the local economy. Then we have working conditions, so emergency of medical care, provision of potable water, accommodation and sanitation. So, now we come into the social, socio-ethical aspects of it as well. Wage discrimination, child labor, forced labor, gender based discriminations and the working conditions. Then social security, so social security means of substance, subsistence. Now coming to the next one which is committee on sustainability assessment. COSA. So, COSA is a set of indicators used for holistic assessment and monitoring of producer organizations towards sustainability. So, these are organizations of producers and it helps in holistic assessment and monitoring of producer organizations towards sustainability. So, it also consists of certain indicators and as you will see these mm, indicators again talk about the same uh, sustainability parameters that we have been discussing so far. So, in COSA, first it talks about certain key characteristics. So, the they are called as the global theme. So, the key characteristics are um, uh, it consists of the core elements, indi uh, indicators, and description. So, the core element in key characteristics is household demographics. So, the producer characteristics, what it means age of decision maker or the producer responsible for the focus crop, grades of school completed, gender, years of experience growing of growing focus crop. Then I have the household revenue, combined revenue from focus crop sales, other crops, other earnings, off farm employment services, business revenue, land or equipment rental and gift and remittances. Then household consumption, number of people, genders, ages, dependency ratio, literacy and school grades completed. So, in first we do a household demographics of the producer to understand the producers characteristics, their earnings and their expenditures. Then we try to understand the characteristics of the farm which consists of so, farm characteristics might consist of management by owner, renter or sharecropper or by a paid manager, farm size, age of focus crop trees if relevant. Say for example, if it is a mango tree. So, the mango tree is productive from certain age to till certain age. So, for such context it might be applicable. So, that is why age of focus crop tree if relevant. Focus crop area, farm location, distance from farm to the nearest commercial center and to medical services. So, first we try to understand the farm characteristics, then we try to understand the land tenure. So, whether it is owned by the farmers, rented and so on. Then I need to understand adverse events, what can be adverse events? So, say for example, shocks like occurrence of major events that led to a serious reduction in the household's income. 
assets or consumption in last production year. Say for example, severe weather, crop or livestock losses, sharp decline in prices and so on. Once I have done with my identification of the key characteristics, I will start with my three uh, sustainability parameters, the social indicators, the economic indicators and the environmental indicators. So, let us start with the social indicators. Again, in when in the social indicators, we follow the same pattern. So, we have a global theme, then we have core elements, then we have an indicator and we have a description of the same. So, the first one is living and working conditions, which consists of health and safety, the living conditions. You can again see when I talk about health and safety, we are talking about restrictions on agrochemical application, protective gear for agrochemical application farm injuries, access to medical services, living conditions, talks about smoke ventilation in cooking area, safe water for domestic use, poverty status. My next global theme is basic human rights and equity, which has as core elements labor rights, education, food security, gender. Mm, many a times a couple of them might not be applicable. Say for example, in your region uh, all farming is activities are done by machines and hence there is no possibility of employing child labor. So, in that particular case one of those indic because it is not applicable they can be also uh, left, but uh, a majority of them is, um, can, is usually applicable. There might be also chances where you might think that certain aspect is not covered into this particular as, uh, chart and you might also in, include those indicators into it. The next global theme is about community, we are in the social indicators, so community is very important. So, in community the core element is participation indicated by community services, produ producer participation in organizations, women's participation in organizations, producer perception of organizations value. Then comes trading relationships. So, whether there is transparency in the trading relationship, whether they have access to market information, price transfer, transparency or whether there is a middleman who is exploiting the producer. Capacity and finance, so financial services, production and post harvest services, community services. Then comes perception how do they perceive? So, in that we have like social situations, so producers opinion on social issues, community care of the environment, social training, quality of life. Why is community care of the environment very important? Say for example, if uh, I am to get a certification for organic farming, it is not only um, uh, that in my farm I do not use any chemical fertilizer and pesticide but it has to be also like in a particular radius that is defined by uh, um, the certifying agencies. So, say for in a radius of 10 kilometer from my farms say for example, no one else should be using uh, chemical or uh, uh, fertilizers or pesticides. So, it is not I alone cannot achieve it and hence for most of these activities it is very important that how I have to see community care of the environment, then social training and quality of life. If you take up the example of Amul as a um, company and if you take up uh, a producer from there and try to do an analysis you will see. So, if you try to do this assessment for um, say Amul take a producer from Amul and try to do the assessment on these indicators or say we took up the example of Varna Pura. So, if you try to do an assessment on these parameters of a producer from Varna Pura, you will see uh, many of these elements have been actually uh, thought of and achieved. As a result, uh, greater sustainability uh, has been achieved on both the contexts. So, let us go ahead next to the environmental indicators. So, the in environmental indicators the first global theme is about resource management. So, 
here we have a resource or input management as a core element where we are talking about so what are the different kinds of resources or inputs they can be nutrients so nutrients can be fertilizers so producers method to determine fertilizer needs soil analysis report advice or assessment of a professional observation knowledge of nutrient depletion by previous crops etc there are scientific methods available by which a producer can determine the right kind of fertilizer mix suitable for his or her crops so whether that kind of activity is undertaken before applying the nutrients or not then npk use efficiency so nitrogen phosphorus and potassium amounts in synthetic fertilizers used and compared to focus crop yields indicates both efficiency and potential pollution then i have integrated pest management so uh, integrated pest management we can do multiple activities together to do pest management so not necessarily pesticide is the only solution for doing pest management but say for example you can also alternate two crops which can bring in pest management there can be many other such techniques so whether the those techniques are being employed on the farm or not so the pesticides use the amount the type the pesticide use efficiency toxicity class of pesticides and then the energy used for doing all these activities next in the resource management is how waste management happens at the farm so responsible waste management is happening or not in which we have to consider materials recycled reused or disposed of properly say for example if biomass is being generated say all the leftovers of the um, uh, after growing rice so we took away the rice and what happens to the rest of the plant that is biomass so it can be burnt which is a waste of biomass as well as it produce it uh, um, uh, produces the polluting effects to the environment it can also be converted into briquettes and used for generating electricity of course it does generate pollution but it also generates electricity we can also that is also a very good source of nutrients so we can also use that as a nutrients and put it back into the soil or we can also use it as a cattle feed so responsible waste management is happening or not then water contamination prevention measures whatever is being taken so here we will uh, consider crop processing waste water animals domestic discharge cleaning of agrochemical application equipment etc all kinds of water contamination uh, all kinds of water waste water which is being generated and if water contamination prevention measures are being taken or not next global theme is about water where we talk about water quality and water quantity so safe water for domestic use water contamination prevention measures and water conservation measures the next global theme is about soil and we are talking about soil conservation conservation from erosion erosion can happen due to water can happen also due to mm, uh, winds so if there is no vegetation cover on top of the mm, uh, soil you can have erosion caused by winds then field maintenance how it is being maintained so methods used to clean annual crop areas after harvest that is whether the crop residue is left on the ground cover whether they are cut they are raking into piles burning etc soil conservation and measures to improve water use so measures taken to conserve soil and improve water use by plants so say for example by con contouring plants or say by mm, mm, making a hill around the plant or by planting the mm, crop on a mm, raised bed one can do proper soil management depend different crops have different requirements say for example rice requires to be dipped in water whereas say mm, wheat requires to be away from water so appropriate measures which are related to soil conservation and improve water usage so nutrient balance 
how it is achieved. So, nutrient balance in a manner that it is related to soil conservation. So, we already discussed that if we do not put the fertilizers properly, they are going to damage the soil because of either the phosphorus or the potassium being excess in water or causing arsenic pollution in uh, the soil or increasing the salinity of the soil. Then comes intercropping. So, intercropping is like growing two or three crops together in alternate say alternate rows or in alternate columns. This helps in inter, uh, by interplanting we can have better soil health, we can also have diversification, soil fertility improves, pest attack also reduces, weed attack also reduces. Then local nutrient cycle, so recycling of organic mat matter and crop waste. Why local? Because of the local say land conditions, weather conditions. So, the nutrient cycle in each region might be different. So, considering them in order to achieve soil conservation. Say for example, in hilly areas, soil conservation mm, is to be done in a very different manner as compared to that in the plains. The next comes is how do we mm, tackle biodiversity in terms of plant diversity genetic diversity and tree density. So, plant diversity talks about plant and tree diversity, genetic diversity talks about species and varietal diversity available. So, you can always read the description to know more about them. So, like portion of focus crop that are improved varieties locally adapted or native heirloom varieties selected to thrive in local conditions hybrid genetically or altered, genetically selected and so on. Then in tree density comes trees per hectare as well as forestation. Then next one is climate change, sequestration and mitigation. So, how do we do carbon stock, how do we use, do land use changes to achieve that. Again the last one, so for each of them the last one is about perception because perception is very important to achieve anything. Hence, it is also important that one should be able to um, capture the perception of the producer. So, environmental perception related environmental situation which will be indicated by producers opinion on environmental issues. Farms care of the environment, community care of the environment and environmental training. Next, we come to the economic indicators. So, in this the first global theme is about producer livelihoods, which we see the core element is revenue where we are talking about focus crop revenue, yield, price, farm revenue, household revenue. Say for example, the price is not at all in the control of the producer maybe it might be governed by local market conditions, global market conditions, governmental policies and so on. Again you can see here when we are talking about farm revenue, we are also talking about training. So, income from providing services like training, nurseries, land and equipment rental etcetera. So, all those activities involved together. Then uh, household revenue, then uh, the next core element is cost, direct cost for focus crop, labor days, labor cost, fertilizer cost, pesticide cost, renovation cost deductions by buyer, energy costs, indirect costs for focus crops if any. So, these can be like capital assets, cultivation practices, trace. So, cultivation practices it might be say like uh, um, uh, drip irrigation or conservation tillage or contour planting. So, they are certain cultivation practices which require certain costs to be incurred. So, say for example, if I do drip irrigation, so the drip irrigation I uh, set it up once and it is not like I have to set it up every year. I might have to spend some money on the um, uh, repairing and replacement of components, but I do not have to do it every um, uh, year. So, um, uh, this is related to cultivation and it is called as an indirect cost because it is uh, not directly linked to the crop that I am growing at that point of time. Whereas, the other costs were more like for that particular crop for that particular time frame. Traceability and record keeping costs of standard or uh, standards or certification in order to get organic certification and any other certification 
one has to apply and spend some money to get that planting and reforestation costs training costs then the next core parameter is about income so net income from focus crop the next global theme is risk the economic resilience so if whether there is diversification or not revenue from other crops are there or not area used for other crops or not number of other crops or animal products other revenue not production related when you do diversification only then you can have economic resilience information so access to market information price transparency credit access to credit credit history then vulnerability so say for example poverty status minimum wage producer insurance whether insurance is available or not whether the producer has it or not then there might be also certain uh, vulnerabilities which come in the way of economic resilience so days without sufficient food gender income differences profit and loss the next global theme is about competitiveness and the core element here is business development so access to market information price transparency farm price to global reference the economic indicators for cosa are so the first global theme is producer livelihoods then we talk about the core element revenue consisting of indicators as crop focus crop revenue yield price farm revenue and household revenue then comes so revenue is point 1 then comes cost where we are talking about direct cost labor days labor cost fertilizer cost so all kinds of input related costs will be part of this particular um, uh, analysis once that is done the um, uh, it will also include certain kind of direct and indirect cost then we come to the next one which is income from the focus crop as well as from other sources then comes diversification so in diversification we try to identify all other ways of making revenue than directly from the crop then we are talking about information related to market access price transparency which are very important for a producer to know so that he or she can achieve economic sustainability then access to credit and credit history next we go upon vulnerability about poverty status minimum wage producer insurance and so on so when you see across all these things you can again see in this case we are trying to discuss about risk and vulnerability then days without sufficient food gender income differences profits and loss then we come into competitiveness they also determine the economic sustainability competitiveness is determined in terms of business development so like access to market information so we also had access to market information in one of the previous other global theme but we uh, always talk about the indicator with respect to the global theme so here in access to market information we will be talking about in terms of business development and competitiveness whereas in the previous one where we had access to the market information it was about risk that is economic resilience so we would be talking in that category about access to market information then we get into um, uh, further aspects of competitiveness say is there a differentiation available so is the producer able to produce some kind of differentiation differentiation can be like practices for product quality in harvesting and processing or due to product quality or due to some kind of certification or standard which will give this uh, producer a competitive advantage in the market then we come into efficiency so when we are talking about efficiency we are talking about the crop, uh, the um, production or labor or technical efficiency and as well as the cost or economic efficiency they also determine competitiveness the next global theme is producer organizations 
where we are talking actually about the governance. So, this producer will be part of certain producer organizations. So, first we try to understand the governance. So, the sustainability various criteria say like how is the woman's participation in the organization? Is it encouraged? It is discouraged or there are disparities or is it only a woman only organization? There are many producer organizations which are they can also say that uh, it is only uh, women oriented organization. Then producer perception of organizations values very important. Then comes the services. So, like financial services, production and post harvest related services. Does the producer organization to which this producer is subscribed to provide these services and what uh, kind and in what manner they are provided. So, like financial services is it on the basis of um, credit or is it on the basis of um, some contract or some other um, some advance or some kind of a grant or what is the kind of financial service available. It can be also some kind of insurance uh, related uh, facility. Then production and post harvest, is, uh, har, uh, post harvest services if any say for example, if I produce uh, turmeric I need post harvest processes to process that turmeric into um, uh, value added products like dried turmeric or powdered turmeric. So, does the producer organization provide them at a um, uh, central location? So, all I need to do is procure all my produce to that particular place. Uh, then comes community related services, does the producer organization provide certain community services or not and what kind. These can be related to agriculture, so you can see improvements in agricultural facilities, access to water or sewage. So, either it is related to agricultural facilities or say other things like access to water or sewage, medical care, road or school, construction etcetera. Why we are also talking in the periphery of uh, these services? Because firstly we are talking about community services. Secondly why they are important? Because this as a whole helps to grow up the producers whole community. As a result everybody prospers not only in the growth of the agriculture product, but an overall growth is possible. So, if you consider the Varna Pura example that we had spoken about in um, two of our lectures. So, you can connect that the Varna Pura, the Varna cooperative as a producer organization it is involved into many kinds of community services like they have um, got into building of water reservoirs, can canals, schools, colleges and so on. Because overall they improve the whole infrastructure and as a result the holistic growth is possible. Then comes perception. So, economic situation related perception. So, producers opinion on economic situation. Then business development training if available. So, that was uh, a discussion on SAFA, RISE and COSA. Now, we will see some other tools. These tools have been are also part of the SAFA uh, toolkit. Uh, we will not go into the depth of these tools, but we will see these tools to know of a wide spectrum of tools which are available in this domain. So, this tool is called as Voluntary Sustainable Standards uh, VSS. It's, a, it's any non-obligatory set of requirements explicitly designed to promote the objectives of sustainable development relating to environmental, social, ethical and food safety issues in the production and processing phases. So, the important point over here is it is a non-obligatory set of requirements. It is often a third party assessed through certification. Say for example, examples in this context are like on organic certification, fair trade uh, related certification, forest stewardship council, marine stewardship council, aquaculture stewardship council. Then comes 
life cycle assessment tools. So, these are similar to the LCA tools that we already discussed. There are specifically data sets which has been created for the field of agriculture. So, if say for, uh, we discussed about open LCA, if you go to the open LCA database, you will see there are certain databases which have been specifically designed with data on agricultural aspects. So, techniques to um, assess impacts associated with all stages of a product's life that is product from inputs, production, processing, manufacture, distribution, retail, consumption and disposal or recycling. So, life cycle assessment can be done for a particular activity or a particular machinery related to agriculture. So, examples of this are the eco invent uh, uh, as a database. Gabi and uh, is a software or even the open LCA software or SEMA Pro they will help you to do these life cycle assessment as we had already de described. There is also something called as social LCA developed by UNEP uh, CTAC and that can be also used. There is also something called as a sustainability consortium TCL, T, uh, TSC. Then there are self assessments and data sharing platforms available. So, some of these platforms are people for earth, Sci platform, soil and more sustainability flower, keystone field to market and leaf. So, these platforms are meant for self assessment. So, a person who is interested in uh, pursuing sustainability and does not want to go for um, uh, certifications as such, but wants to do a self assessment can go ahead um, share their data and use this data sharing platforms one of these and try to um, do a self assessment. In the next lecture, we will be discussing about um, uh, sustainability and tools, uh, sustainability tools and approaches um, which are very suitable for the design of cities and communities. Thank you.